What's up guys, Sean here, and today we're gonna talk about Adam Ruins Everything. Adam Ruins Everything is a popular college humor churned true TV show that purports to debunk popular myths and misconceptions with facts, evidence, and hard data. While True TV tends to sell Adam Ruins Everything as a fact-based show, when you dig into one of their episodes, especially one of their more recent episodes, you tend to notice that they're actually perpetuating myths rather than debunking them. And a perfect example is the recent episode Adam did on sitcoms. An episode that's premise revolves around the idea that it's not okay for sitcoms to make jokes about racial stereotypes. Actually, Sitcoms like this one sure love making jokes about stereotypes, but the roots of these stereotypes are no laughing matter. Which is a really odd premise for a fact-based show to have because that premise is inherently opinion-based. Whether or not you should or shouldn't tell certain jokes is inherently subjective. According to my calculations, Trey, you haven't finished your math homework yet. We're gonna be late for Denise's pool party. What you talking about, computer? Inviting a black guy to a pool party is like inviting you to a cool party. Now the episode starts with a terrible, unfunny, cringe-inducing sitcom. I'm not gonna bust their balls too much for this opening because it's intentionally a bad sitcom, but I will point out that within 30 seconds of the episode, we see some serious virtue signaling about race. Cut! What are you doing? This is comedy gold. Eh, more like comedy lead. Let me bring in my own writer and researcher to show you what's what. We got new scripts. A lot of changes. What are you talking about? We don't need to change a thing. <laughs> are you kidding me? Our show is terrible. It appears to me that the point of this segment is to show that Adam Ruins Everything has a black writer on staff as he's in the show as the black writer rewriting the sitcom. A sitcom that is curiously being run by an angry white man. Now this is supposed to convey the message that racial stereotypes come from angry white men and if only we had more minorities in the writing room, we wouldn't see these stereotypes. However, in reality, we do have black written sitcoms in America and black produced sitcoms in America, and those sitcoms tend to have the same stereotypes because black people make jokes about stereotypes about black people. And the reason they do that is because comedy is universal and it shouldn't be policed along racial lines. Minorities aren't made of glass. They're just like anybody else. They can make and take jokes. You go to a pool party, I'm black. Black people can't swim? <laughs> Time out. Boy, TV comedies like this sure love making jokes about black stereotypes. Yeah, they're hilarious. And maybe to you. Of course the stupid white man would find that funny, am I right? Freaking angry white people always promoting racism. Yeah, they're hilarious. And maybe to you. Stupid white man. I just want to point out the obnoxious virtue signaling in this segment because Adam Ruins Everything has actually labeled the two minorities on set as people who work behind the scenes at Adam Ruins Everything. Because once again, the purpose of this episode, first and foremost, is to virtue signal about race. The ironic part of that is that inserting your staff in this way and then labeling it so everybody knows that they're a part of your staff is using them as props. Adam Ruins Everything inserted these people into the show and labeled them as such for the sole purpose of letting you know that they exist and they work at Adam Ruins Everything. So you would give them credit for having them on staff. Hilarious. And maybe to you. But these jokes aren't so funny when you realize that these stereotypes have a really dark history. Yeah, and while many Americans know this story all too well, apparently some of us still need to hear it. Black apparently some Americans still need to hear it. The white ones, obviously. That's, that's who Adam's referring to. Black people don't have some natural inability to swim. Yeah, obviously there's nothing innate about being black that prevents you from knowing how to swim or learning how to swim. I think a very small percentage of the people who reference that stereotype believe that. The majority of people who reference that stereotype are pointing out that black people, on average, are less likely to know how to swim than white people. Black people don't have some natural inability to swim. Way to build up a straw man. The truth is, for decades, they weren't allowed to. In the 1920s and 30s, the government built thousands of new public pools, but they were mostly in white neighborhoods. And until 1964, Southern segregation laws barred black swimmers from using them. Adam goes over the history of segregation of public pools within the United States. A general rule about segregation, if you don't know, 
is if you can think of it, it was probably segregated at the time. So for me, he gets a little bit of points because when most people think of segregation, they think of buses, restaurants, bathrooms, and water fountains. So in that way, he is providing information to people who may not have known about the public pool situation. But if you didn't realize it, segregation extended to basically everything, including cemeteries. Is that swimming never became a part of black culture. Today, 70% of black Americans don't know how to swim. Oh wow, I didn't realize it was that high. 70% of African Americans don't know how to swim. I wonder if that's where the stereotype comes from. And according to the CDC, black 11 year olds are 10 times more likely to drown than white 11 year olds. But that's not because of natural ability. It's because of access and opportunity. So Adam caps it off by saying that black 11 year olds are 10 times more likely to drown than white 11 year olds which makes perfect sense because only 30% of African Americans know how to swim. The way Adam presents his factoid is as if he's saying that the water is racist, but no, a population that's way less likely to know how to swim is way more likely to drown. This is literally the most obvious thing in the world, and if you want your kids to know how to swim, either teach them how to swim or take them somewhere where they can get lessons and learn how to swim. There's nothing preventing you from learning how to swim if you're black in America today. And once again, the vast majority of jokes about black people not knowing how to swim aren't about them being genetically incapable of learning how to swim. It's about the fact that black people are more likely to not know how to swim than the general population. According to your own show, this is true for seven out of every 10 African Americans. The same is true of basketball. From the 1920s through the 50s, basketball was actually the most popular sport among poor Jewish people in urban neighborhoods. That's because the equipment is relatively inexpensive and it doesn't require a field. So now he's moved on to basketball and he talked about how basketball used to be really popular, specifically amongst Jewish Americans. And in the early days of the NBA, Jewish people dominated the sport. And then people made generalizations about why that is the case. As a result, in the early years of the NBA, the league was dominated by Jewish players. Shit, man. But many Americans made racist assumptions about why Jewish people had a natural advantage. Boy, all you Jews are good at basketball. It must be because of your naturally scheming mind, artful dodging, and general smart aleckness. Now we'll get into this more later, but I do want to point out that the level of talent in the NBA back then when Jewish people were dominant is nowhere near the level of talent that's in the league now. If you put the five best basketball players on the court in 1950 and you played them against a modern team of the top five players, they get destroyed. There's way more money in the NBA now and that money has drawn talent from around the world to the league. So the NBA then and now is completely not comparable. Yeesh. As Jewish people were permitted to assimilate into white culture and moved out of the inner cities, black people moved in. As Jews were allowed to assimilate into white culture in America, that's a completely erroneous, meaningless statement. What he's actually referring to is Jews moving from poor to middle class to upper middle class. There was no board of white people that just decided all of a sudden to include Jewish among white people and anti-Semitism never really went away. Just look at the numbers of anti-Semitic hate crimes and you can clearly see that. Jewish people worked hard and were successful in spite of that anti-Semitism, not because it went away. Moved out of the inner cities, black people moved in and started playing more basketball. But again, many people assumed it was all about race. Wow, all you black people are good at basketball. It must be because of your natural advantage. Okay, so what Adam is saying here is mostly true. Basketball is one of the most popular sports among black people in America. So it's not surprising that the demographic breakdown of the NBA looks the way it does. This is true in that if hockey were as popular among black people as basketball was, we'd probably see similar demographics in the NHL that we see in the NBA. So it is obviously really dumb to just look at a random black person and assume that they're good at basketball. But the thing that Adam gets wrong is that there is a genetic component to athleticism. There's a really interesting article about how sprinters tend to descend from West Africa, while long distance runners tend to come from East Africa. And this is true whether or not they are raised in West or East Africa, or they're just descendant from people 
who lived in East or West Africa. Now, a common origin for specific traits would suggest a genetic origin for specific traits. Now, that's not to say that everybody from West Africa is a sprinter and everybody from East Africa is gonna be an amazing long distance runner. What people are saying is that one in a million genetic ability that allows you to be a super athlete in some populations probably occurs more like two or three in a million. Obviously what sport that athletic ability goes towards is totally dependent on where that person grows up. If the person with that ability is born and raised in the United States of America, that might show up in the NFL or the NBA. If they're born in Latin America, those talents will probably be used for soccer. And those born in Venezuela, Puerto Rico, Cuba, the Dominican Republic, those talents will probably end up going towards baseball. So yeah, it is completely ridiculous to expect somebody randomly from one racial group to perform better athletically than somebody randomly from another racial group. That's not what people are referring to when they typically reference a natural advantage. LeBron James is six foot eight, 280 pounds, and he runs like the wind. He has natural advantages over somebody who's five foot 10, 180 pounds. That's not to say that LeBron doesn't work hard. Every off season, he tries to improve an aspect of his game that he feels is a weak part of his game. But it's so obvious that LeBron has natural advantages over everybody in the NBA, it would be ignorant to ignore it. I push myself to the edge of my limits and beyond. But you've been born with a natural talent far beyond my own. No amount of training could have closed the gap between us. TV and movies are rampant with Asian stereotypes. So next, Adam moves on to Asian stereotypes. He starts talking about the racism against Chinese people when they passed the Chinese Exclusion Act. We were so hostile to Chinese people, the country passed laws banning Chinese immigration and denying their freedoms. They were stereotyped as a lazy, opium-addicted, menacing horde dubbed the Yellow Peril. Yeah, Americans had a lot of negative perceptions of Chinese people, and that led to the act being passed. Because of anti-Asian racism during World War II, the United States interned Japanese Americans in concentration camps. A point of contention here, they weren't concentration camps. Concentration camps are where the Jews were taken by the Nazis and then they were massacred. The Japanese people were held there. It was a violation of their rights. There's no justification for it. There wasn't evidence of rampant Japanese people being spies for the Japanese government. And it was in part fueled by racism but they weren't concentration camps. Uncle Sam, why didn't you do that to German Americans in World War II? Yeah, I wonder. Because, because they're, they're white. white. This is probably the worst offense of the entire episode for Adam Ruins Everything because the show is supposed to be about debunking popular myths and misconceptions about history and other topics. And it is a myth and misconception that the US government did not intern German and Italian Americans during World War II. In fact, not only were Germans interned during World War II, they were interned during World War I. During World War I and World War II, German Americans were required to register as enemy aliens. During World War I, the requirement to register was for every male age 14 and up. They were required to keep their registration card on them at all times, and hundreds of thousands were forced to sign up. Thousands ended up being arrested or interned, and while the scales were not nearly as high as they were for Japanese Americans, the reason for that was probably due to the fact that Japan had attacked the US homeland in a way that Germany had not. And if you're wondering, World War I wasn't the first time that happened. Lincoln suspended habeas corpus during the Civil War. The reality is, is that America has a long history of suspending the rights of due process during wartime, and arresting people suspected of being enemies. And that's happened to Americans who are believed to be fighting on the wrong side of the Civil War. It happened to American citizens of German heritage during World War I. And it happened to varying degrees to Italians, Germans, and Japanese people during World War II. And for Adam Ruins Everything to blatantly lie and say that this did not happen to Germans is horrible. Especially when the entire basis of this episode is about racial politics. Because lying about racism tends to stoke racial tensions in the country, and that's a horrific thing to do and they should be ashamed of themselves. All that changed when the U.S. needed to suck up to its Asian allies during the Cold War. See, as the Soviet Union rose to power, the U.S. worried that Soviet propaganda was making communism sound dynamite. Yes, part of Americans' attitudes about Asians changed during the Cold War because a lot of Asian nations were falling to communism. And the reason for that is because these communist regimes are the most brutal in human history. In 1965, Congress approved a landmark immigration law that 
ditched racist restrictions, but it gave preference to immigrants who had training, talent, or skill sets that would benefit the U.S. economy. Sammy and the Rippers are changing their tune. Borders now open for smart, successful Asian immigrants. <laughs> While it is true that the 65 Immigration Act did allow a lot of high-skilled immigrants into the United States, it also allowed a lot more low-skilled immigrants into the United States with the diversity visa lottery. Weird how Adam decided to just leave that part out. In the 1960s, government officials looked at socioeconomic data from African-American communities and contrasted it to the so-called family values and stability of Asian Americans. Now, this fueled racist claims that black people had no one to blame but themselves if they experienced poverty and other social disadvantages. I want to make this perfectly clear. For the vast majority of people within the United States, the person who is responsible for where you are can be found in a mirror. Of course, there are people who are in poverty due to no fault of their own, but that's the exception, not the rule. And the idea that pointing that out is racist is absolutely and completely ridiculous. And it's not true that all Asians are crazy rich and successful. <laughs> The poverty rate for Asian Americans is actually higher than the national average. And frankly, it's kind of ridiculous that we lump people from so many different backgrounds together as Asian. This is another non-point. Of course, Asians aren't a monolith and some Asians do better than other Asians. But white people aren't a monolith either, and the same is true for white people. Different groups of white people also succeed and fail at different rates. That doesn't mean that overall white people aren't doing well in America, just like it doesn't mean that overall Asians aren't doing well in America. And if Adam Ruins Everything had any integrity, they would treat white people just like they're treating Asian people in this episode. You know what, Uncle Sammy? This is all your fault. Get out of my room. Whoa, watch the hair. And I think this scene encapsulates what this episode is all about more than anything I could possibly say. You have characters in Adam Ruins Everything literally telling the personification of America that everything wrong is all its fault. Sometimes the words left-wing propaganda get thrown out a little too loosely, but this is not one of those cases. The whole crux of the first half of this episode is blame America. All the problems that everybody's facing, all the negative stereotypes, are the fault of America and not the fault of anybody involved. I'm gonna leave it here. There's a whole second half of this episode I could also delve into. I guess I'll see how this video performs and then I'll make my decision. If you want me to do that, then maybe tell me in the comments down below. But for now, that's gonna be it. If you like this video, then please show me by leaving a like. You can subscribe for more content, follow me on all my social media, support me via one-time donation on PayPal or monthly through Patreon. This has been me taking down another episode of Adam Ruins Everything. Till next time.